We have a special guest and a special program for you at lunch today. We will hear from Laura Gottsteiner and then present the Innovation Awards. I am pleased to introduce our guest speaker this afternoon, Laura Gottsteiner. Laura is an investigative journalist and author of A Dream Foreclosed, Black America and the Fight for a Place to Call Home, which was published in 2013. Her work has appeared in Rolling Stone and other popular publications. She has been an invited speaker at universities including Columbia University, New York University, and the University of Chicago, as well as at policy panels hosted by the Center for American Progress and the Congressional Black Caucus. She has appeared on MSNBC and Democracy Now! to speak about the 2008 economic crisis, lending discrimination, and the current housing recovery. She earned a bachelor's degree in literature from Yale University. I saw Laura speak on Book TV. Some of you may watch Book TV occasionally uh, on the weekends and uh, knew when I heard about her book and heard her discussion that we would really enjoy having her here in Kentucky for this conference. So please give a warm Kentucky welcome to Laura Gottsteiner. Good afternoon, and thank you for having me. I want to start just by recounting um, a story that I was told in Chicago three years ago, um, and which also serves as the opening um, for my book. Uh, this story was told to me by uh, a young girl at the time she was 11, and she was speaking about an event that had happened two years earlier, so in two, when she was nine. Uh, we were standing in the middle of her living room. It was, there was a really bad heat wave in Chicago that summer, and, and we were all sort of uh, hot, and there wasn't AC. And so she closed her eyes, and she's standing in front of me, and she says, uh, the first thing I remember is that the police were at the door. I heard running footsteps on the stairs, and then I heard a man shouting, Martha Biggs, Mrs. Biggs, open up. That was her mother. She heard from the living room floor in which she was sitting with her younger sister playing Barbies, the banging of men's fists on the door. And then a much heavier bang that she later found out was a battering ram. It was the weekend um, and she also, she and her sisters had their progress report cards. Uh, they had just been released from Salazar Elementary School. So her big plan for the day was to go with her mom and pick up her progress report cards because she was a really good student. She was really excited to go get her report card. So the pounding grew louder and she it didn't go to the door. Uh, she went to the window and she looked out the window and she saw that there was a line of police cars, about a half dozen of them, and all of their lights were flashing. At this point, her mother has gone to the door to open, uh, open it up uh, and she sees that there's seven police officers shining this big flashlight in her eyes. Um, and at that moment, this woman, Martha Biggs, uh, her dreams just explode. Uh, the year is 2010. It's the year that for the first time in US history, banks seized more than one million homes, evicting approximately 3,000 families, like this girl's family, every single day. So after that, things started to happen really fast. Martha, their mother, yelled at the girls to get dressed. The girls run into the bathroom. They start to get dressed. Their older sister, Joanna, starts helping the mother grab these bags of clothes and get things packed up. The girls come out of the bathroom. A female police officer kneels down because the girls aren't wearing shoes and they're not wearing a coat. And she says, listen, it's winter. You need to put on shoes and you need to put on a coat. At that point, Martha goes to rouse her three-year-old son, uh, Davian. And then the five of them, they all go get in the car. Um, and they fit, but it's tight. Uh, it's a big white minivan. And Martha, the mother, is sitting in the front seat, Joanna next to her, the oldest daughter. And then Jemiah, Justice, and Davian in the back seat with all the coats and the clothes. 
And they drive away from that house, um, and Martha drives straight to Salazar Elementary School to pick up the school, the girls' report cards, which were good, as they'd anticipated. And that was their home for the next two years, that car. And as Martha was driving away and she's heading to the elementary school, she told me later, she said, I knew that this eviction was not just part of the 2008 housing crisis. I know that this part of a much longer story, a story about housing, about race, and about freedom that crisscrosses America's history like the stitches on a quilt. And so then this is the story that, that, that uh, this girl tells me. And then she opens her eyes and she says, listen, you know, when I was homeless, it wasn't like I was dirty because my mom made sure I wasn't. But then I was going to school with everything on my mind of what had happened the other night. That yesterday I got a house, but what about today? I might have to sleep in the car today. I might get a good meal today. But will I get a meal? Will something go wrong? What will happen? How am I going to get home today? And so I guess I want to step back and say I'm, I'm really grateful to be here. I mean, I'm really grateful to be in a room with so many people who work day in and day out to dedicate themselves and their lives to protecting affordable housing, to protecting cities from the demolition of public housing, to protecting the Fair Housing Act, and to making sure that we're moving closer rather than farther to a country in which the basic human right to housing is something that is respected and something that everybody can achieve. Um, I think I have the math straight, and I think that KHC's founder, May Street Kid, would be 111 years old this year. And I didn't know her personally. Um, but I have to imagine, as so many other people who have been civil rights fighters and housing justice fighters for so many years have, have said and have told me, I have to imagine that she too would be both so proud of all the work that's been done and so daunted by how little has changed. And one thing that particularly struck me about May Street Kid as I was researching her political career um, is that is one thing that she said to the editor of the Louisville Courier Journal really early on in her political career. And so she would, she would be at these meetings and she would go to the votes and she would do her work and then she would see a news item in the newspaper the next day in which she's never quoted. You know, and nobody ever, none of the journalists ever asked what her opinion on the issue was. And so she would call up, and this is the editor we're calling later, right after um, May Street Kid's death, and she was, she, the editor says, she would call up and she would say, I was there and nobody asked me. And I think that that's something that we have to think about how true that rings when we talk about housing policy and the so-called housing recovery that we're currently in. Since 2008, we've seen at least, and this is a, a very conservative estimate, but I always got in trouble when I would give a, a greater estimate, so I go with the conservative estimate. We've seen at least 10 million people pushed out of their homes and apartments through bank foreclosure alone since 2007. And that's not to count the number of untold millions of people who have been pushed out through the continued demolition of public housing, through tax foreclosure, and through the rapid gentrification of many U.S. cities. And I think it's also important to say, and I'm going to you know, bring out the Wall Street Journal later, but I think it's important to say this crisis is so far from over. Um, I'm currently doing some reporting in Wayne County, in Detroit, and in Highland Park, and right now 100,000 people are facing tax foreclosure in, the count in Wayne County, which encompasses the city of Detroit and, and Highland Park and a few other areas. That's after 250,000 people were pushed out of the city of Detroit from bank foreclosure. So we are in the midst of, and I know so many people do this work day in and day out and don't need me to tell you this, but we're in the midst of what is a perpetual and constant crisis to defend the human right to housing. And yet so often as housing and economic policy is made to return to May Street Kids' words, the actual people who are being displaced, the actual people who have been foreclosed on, the actual children and parents who have had to leave because there's a battering ram at their door, don't really have a voice in this conversation very frequently. 
And so they'd be very correct in saying, I was there, and nobody asked me. So I want to talk a little bit about, or I was invited to talk about um, some of the reporting and research that I did on grassroots social justice and housing justice movements in the wake of the 2008 crisis, in which really the goal was to say, you know, you were there, you lived this, you fought this, sometimes you've won this, what happened? But I just want to very briefly talk a little bit about what's at stake um, for those who don't work directly um, or who aren't personally facing uh, the threat of foreclosure or eviction. And I think that sometimes we're up against this battle and this, again, is in this Wall Street Journal article today. We're up against this battle that the issue about affordable housing or about foreclosure or eviction is a problem of credit scores and sometimes an issue of chandeliers. This is not an issue of chandeliers, as so many people in this room know. This is, for millions of people across the country, an actual issue of life and death. And so I just want to bring... Uh, to your attention, a recent CDC study, Center for Disease Control study, that showed that suicide rates that were directly related to foreclosure and eviction doubled between the years of 2005 and 2010. And by 2010, suicide was the second leading cause of death for people in the United States between the ages of 25 and 34. Which means for people in my generation right now, suicide is the second leading cause of death. And a not inconsequential number of those are related to foreclosure and eviction. Uh, Joanna, for example, Jemiah's older sister who helped her mom bag up the clothes and get ready to get into the car, attempted suicide one year later. Luckily, she did not succeed. <laughs> Uh, a woman who I'm living with in Detroit right now, uh, who's a member of the school board, and I told her I was coming down here, said, you know, I've never really talked about this, but a few years ago my cousin uh, was getting foreclosed on her. On she'd, been, um, she'd fallen behind on her mortgage because the house needed a lot of repairs, and she was, she was striving to be a foster care parent, so she had to get the house up to code, and she chose between getting the house up to code and paying her mortgage, and she fell behind on her mortgage. And when the sheriff came to evict her, she locked herself in a closet and tried to set the house on fire. Again, luckily, the firefighters got her before she died. <laughs> but the house burned down, and Bank of America still wanted its money, um, which was a long battle that ended up resulting in her having to sell her mother's house. So I think that um, as a nation, outside this room, we really have to change the way that we're talking about housing. Um, and a lot of my work, as I mentioned, has been to speak with and, and be with the social justice grassroots housing movements that are really across the country trying to fight, you know, both to, to save affordable housing, to stop foreclosure and eviction, but also to completely change the way that we're talking about housing and to get people across this country to understand that housing is not a commodity only, but it's also a basic human right. And I think, and I just want to add really quickly that in Spain, um, where there was also a, an incredible amount of, of foreclosures and evictions in the wake of the 2008 crisis, um, which is continuing, um, there were so many suicides, but not so many more than here. I sort of did like a statistical calculation. There were so many suicides though, that there was such public outrage that people's neighbors were killing themselves because the sheriffs were at the door, that they actually passed a moratorium on, on evictions in a number of different cases. Not across the board, uh, but for people with children in the home, for people with elderly people in the home, or people who had recently lost their job, they said, you can't be evicted right now. We're having a temporary moratorium because we don't want a rash of suicides in our country. So some of the questions that I grapple with all the time is how do we, how could we have a similar response in the United States that we don't want to have a rash of suicides, that we don't want to see suicide rates double and not take pretty serious legislative action and dramatic action. So, okay, so I'm going to tell much more inspiring stories um, about direct action and social justice struggles
some of which have been very successful. But I want to stop briefly and explain why I would talk about that. Because I think so many of us in this room do really good work uh, on advocacy, on policy issues, on legislative issues. And so there's the question, what's, what's with the protests outside that bank? <laughs> or what's with the protests at that house? And I think that it's important to remember constantly as we do this work that we would not have the Fair Housing Act, we would not have the Fair Lending Act, we would not have the New Deal, we would not have had the creation of the FHA without massive social justice movements on the ground. Um, and I'm going to briefly bring in uh, some of the research of Mark Nason, who is a uh, professor up at Fordham University in New York, who has written extensively, and if you want more of this, check out his work, written extensively about the housing justice movements in, during the Great Depression. Um, most of which, by the way, was led by the Communist Party, but we're not supposed to talk about that. Um, and he said there was so many eviction blockades, and an eviction blockade is exactly what it sounds like, people saying we will blockade this house so that the sheriff can't evict. There were so many eviction blockades all across New York City in the late 20s and 30s that he went back through the newspapers, the Times and the Post, and you had landlords saying, complaining to the newspapers, you know, we can't evict anybody in the Bronx. We can't evict anybody in Harlem. We can't evict anybody in the Lower East Side because there were so many women, and housing justice movements are almost always led by women across the world, but particularly in the United States. Uh, there were so many women from Harlem and the Lower East Side and the Bronx that had gone down to the garment industry, the garment sort of section in Manhattan, and bought these large hat pins. This is when, you know, people made things. Uh, large hat pins and big bags of marbles. And when there was an eviction, women would line up shoulder to shoulder and hold, and these are, young, these are oftentimes really young first generation women um, from all over the world and African-American women, particularly, um, hold these uh, hat pins and stand shoulder to shoulder. And so there was this sort of little like uh, row of hat pin barricade. And the police, who didn't want to like attack these 16 and 17 and 19 year old women, would sort of form, ooh, I'm sorry, would form this ring around, around the building. And then finally tired and having to get their job done, they would bring in the horses. So they would bring in police officers mounted on horses to scare the women away. And that's when the marbles came in handy because there was other women up on the roof uh, on the top of this six floor tenement building, which is so much of the New York housing stock. And they would drop the marbles and then all the horses would fall down, which is a story that sometimes gets me in trouble with animal rights activists. So I'm not advocating for it, I'm just, recounting the history. And so it's, and it's funny, right? It's funny, this vision of these women with these hat pins and these marbles, but what was the result? We have tenant laws in New York City. 26 states passed moratoriums during the Great Depression saying, we will not foreclose on anyone for two years because we're in the midst of a financial crisis. And because we can't evict them anyway. They won't let us. So some of this type of direct action and community organizing has also sprung up in the wake of the 2008 economic crisis. Not to the scale, which is why we haven't seen the massive policy shifts, but it did happen and it is happening. And I want to tell uh, briefly the story of uh, this woman named Bertha Garrett who lives in Northwest Detroit, lives, present tense, because of this story. Um, and she was one of the very first people I spoke to while I was doing this reporting. And I met her in her living room on a late Sunday afternoon about three years ago. And she'd just gotten back from church. And this is a woman who is sitting there. I'm so intimidated, to be clear. This is a woman who's sitting there in this gorgeous white pressed suit with these prim ruffles and this embroidered muslin shawl and a cream colored smock and this massive large brimmed white southern hat that I don't even know how she got through the door with. And she, like so many others, her family had come up from the south um, and they lived downtown and they rented and then 22 years before the time that we spoke, she and her husband who worked as a barber for Motown had gone out and bought a home. 
really far out in northwest Detroit. And it was in the what's considered the wrong part of town, but it was her house. And in fact, it had been built by hand by the previous homeowner because there was no lending in that section of Detroit because the entire neighborhood had been redlined. And so everybody on the block had built their houses by hand because they could not get any financing. So she fell in love with this house and she moved into it because the woman, her husband had, had died and she needed to sell and she was moving in with her family. So she moves in and Bertha Garrett and her family live in Detroit in that, in that neighborhood, uh, in that house for 22 years. And she raises a whole slew of sons. She raises like five sons and they all go to ministry school. She raises her daughter as well. And they pay off, they get a, t they get a small loan, like $40,000, and they pay it off, and they own the house free and clear. And in the late 90s, she started getting phone calls. Every day, she got a phone call saying, listen, you've got all this money bound up in your house. Take out a second mortgage, help your sons get through ministry school. You don't want them to end up in a bunch of debt, do you? So she takes out a $45,000 loan. Within a few years, that loan, and she pays her loan payment every month. She pays, she gets a, she gets a you know, bill in the mail, and she pays what she owes. And it's not a lot, but it's also not a big loan. She didn't know <laughs> that it was a ballooning predatory mortgage that within a few years ballooned to $190,000. As an aside, I want to thank you all for that reaction because I recently spoke to a class of undergraduates at New York University and I said that and they stared at me. <laughs> and I was like, is there something wrong? And they were like, what's a mortgage? <laughs> so then I had to do like a real backup. Um, so she owes $190,000. <laughs> which she obviously can't pay. This is um, an older couple, uh, and her sons you know, are helping support her, but they're ministers, they're not making a lot of money either. Um, meanwhile, the house's value is just plummeting as Detroit and so many other American cities go through the um, just, just sort of like shock waves of the financial crisis. So she tries to fight her foreclosure in court and she loses and she tries to fight her foreclosure in court again and she loses and she gets a new lawyer and he loses and finally the lawyer tells her eldest daughter, listen, your mother has lost this house and if she refuses to face the facts, you should probably check her into some sort of like home or asylum because she's going crazy. But Bertha, she told me later, was not going crazy. <laughs> she did not want to leave her home. Uh, so finally, a few days after, or a few days before the scheduled eviction, she said to her daughter, she said, listen, I'm not, I'm not packing, I'm not going anywhere. And what she told me later was, it was not, she said, that I didn't understand that the banks owned a piece of paper. It was that the banks didn't understand that I owned my home. And that's not something that on, in the court system or on a spreadsheet makes a lot of sense. But to this woman and so many millions and tens of millions of other people across this country, that understanding of a moral law makes a lot of sense. And so she called the newspapers and she called her neighbor and she called her church. And the day that the city sent a contractor to drop off a dumpster in front of her house per city ordinance, it's part of the eviction process, and have this man go into her home and haul out everything her and her family had amassed for the last 22 years. Instead, he found like hundreds of people in the street and on her front lawn. And this was a day that was so cold and so slick and so icy that the newspapers were saying, don't go outside, there's already been a ton of traffic accidents. And so the man, who's not being paid by, very much, by the way, as a contractor, says, well, I, I can't drop this dumpster off. So he tries to sort of drop it off in front of other people's houses on the block, and all the neighbors come out and say, we know what you're doing. We know what you're here for. Go, go, go. So he moves on to the next job. And meanwhile, Bertha goes down to the Dime Building, which is sort of like the financial outpost um, in, in Detroit. And she goes up to the ninth floor, which is the floor of her lender, New York Bank of Mellon, who at that point, it wasn't her original lender, it was that point the person who owned the mortgage or held the mortgage. 
And she said, listen, we've just, we've turned around the dumpster. Like, I, I feel like I have a little bit of like negotiating power at this point. You know, can I have a meeting? And the secretary says, you don't, ma'am, you don't have a meeting today. You can't come into this office. And she, she's standing there. She's standing there in her church best, the same sort of outfit that I saw her in with this big white pressed suit and this huge southern hat. And she says, well, if I can't come in, none of you guys can come out. And, and she lies down, crushing the side of her hat in front of the office, prohibiting anyone. And this is, I think at this point, a 65-year-old woman preventing anybody from coming in or out. So the newspapers love this. And the community loves this. And before you know it, there's all these people rallying downstairs on the street level of the Dime Building. There's reporters all up in the elevators. There's people calling New York Bank of Mellon for a comment. There's this lady lying outside of your office. What's going on? And by the next day, the bank's lawyers called and said, call this off. If she wants the house, she can have the house. And a few, days a few weeks later, she sat down with representatives from the banks, and she signed the paperwork to buy her house outright for $10,000, because that's what the house was worth at that point. So obviously, I heard that story, and I was like, what? And so I, I spent a few years going around the country listening to other stories just like that. Um, and I can't recount them all. Um, I've written a lot about them if you want to hear more. Um, I met a man who, on a national day of action, who was being evicted that day, um, bought a bunch of bricks and cement and sealed himself inside his house. And when the sheriff came and opened the door, which he'd left unlocked, he found a brick wall. I met a woman in Minneapolis who had been fighting her foreclosure from U.S. Bank for many years with an incredible amount of community support. She'd gone to the shareholders' meetings. She'd had meetings. She'd offered to pay. She had lawyers. They'd done protests. And finally, a week before her eviction, and U.S. Bank is saying, we are taking this really seriously. We are going through with this. She goes to Home Depot, and she buys a truck worth of dirt. And as it's getting delivered, her neighbors come over, and they're like, what are you doing? And she's like, oh, I'm planting a garden out back. And they're like, aren't, aren't you, aren't you going to be evicted next week? And she's like, no, no, I'm not going to be evicted next week. I live here. This is my home. I've paid for it multiple times over. And she was not. They won it. She's still there. Um, so these are the kinds of stories that work on an individual level, right? But we need to scale this. And you know, and the leaders of these movements are very clear. We cannot blockade everybody's house. This needs to be scaled. So I want to speak briefly about some of the things that people are proposing to use to scale it. But I also want to just spend one minute, two minutes, speaking about where these types of housing justice actions and struggles fit in the broader context and the broader civil rights and human rights landscape today particularly this year, the 50th anniversary of Selma, we're at a moment where institutional racism in housing is arguably the most violent and the most powerful form of racism today. And that's saying something when right now the internet is reverberating with a video of a South Carolina police officer shooting a 50-year-old father in the back as he tried to get away. And then returning to his body after he died and placed the stun gun underneath the man's body to corroborate his story that the man had tried to steal his stun gun and they'd gotten in some sort of tuffle. And I'm bringing that in because I think it is really important to acknowledge whatever race we are, I'm obviously a white American, it's really important to acknowledge that we live in a country dominated by interpersonal and institutional racism. And that the racism of housing is that geography and structure, literal and physical, that supports the system of white supremacy. And if there's any doubt, Read Ta-Nehisi Coates' The Case for Reparations in the Atlantic. He's much more convincing than I am. Um, and it stretches 
it explains the way that the moment that we're in right now, housing and otherwise, stretches right back to the time of slavery and everything in between. So um, I want to commend you all uh, for a very good study, which I'm sure is available on many tables around this conference room, um, which you guys just sent, uh, handed to me. And one of the findings of the study is that the Fair Housing Act is violated four million times a year which I didn't bother to break down how many times a day, because it's four million times a year. Um, the white to black wealth gap is 12 to one, and that's the conservative estimate, which means white Americans are walking around with 12 times more wealth than black Americans today. And I think the things that was the most striking to me as I was doing research on foreclosure and eviction was how blatant this all was during the lead up to the 2008 crash, and probably still today, but we just haven't had the hearings and the congressional hearings and the testimonies to prove it. So one of the things that really struck me was what a Le Wells Fargo loan officer said when he was under oath at a congressional hearing. And he said, yeah, we put bounties on the heads of minority borrowers. Those were his words, not mine, bounties. And why did they do that? And it's because it was financially incentivized at that moment, after so many decades of redlining, to then flood neighborhoods that had historically been starved of credits, neighborhoods like Bertha Garrett's, flood them with bad loans, flood them with unpayable loans, and make money off of the nation's history of institutional racism. So that's all sort of the racial and social underpinning of these movements. And that's why when we talk about housing movements, we're not just talking about housing movements, we're talking about civil rights movements. And we're talking about human rights movements. And I think that's why, and I wanna just take a real quick minute to, to shout out a few of the black-led and community of color-led organizations and networks that are today doing some of the best housing justice movement work on the ground. Um, and that would be Take Back the Land, which is a national network. Um, and you can particularly take a look at the Chicago Anti-Eviction Campaign, which is their Chicago branch. Big New York Times fe magazine feature on them last year. Um, and I covered them in the book as well. Uh, Poor People Economic and Human Rights Campaign, which is a national network. And then the Welfare Rights Organization, another national network, and I'm working with them the Michigan branch in Detroit right now um, to learn more about the water issue and the tax foreclosures issues in Detroit. Um, so what do we what do we do, right? Because that that was um, that was heavy again. Well, I think what we do is keep doing our work. So many people in this room are doing such good work to protect affordable housing, to preserve affordable housing, to stop the demolition of public housing, to advocate that we actually rebuild public housing. Um, so many people are doing good work to try to make violations of the Fair Housing Act not be four million violations a year. Um, I think there's also people in this room and abroad or, and across the country doing really good model building, trying to propose other models that we can use. So I want to do, I want to give a quick shout out to the first community land trust in the state of Kentucky, the Lexington Community Land Trust, which is joining this coalition of community land trusts across the country. Uh, there's 250 now and they're growing every year. And community land trusts are one of the many innovative models of which there, there are many, in which we can start to see that the dream of home ownership can be coupled with community control of the land and removing speculative value from the land. And so we can all own our home, but we can also live in a community where, at least during the 2008 crash, the rate of foreclosure on community land trusts was 10%, so 10 times more successful at keeping people in their homes than across regular for-profit housing. So that's one model. Um, and the last thing that I want to propose, and this is in part because I'm a writer, so this is a lot of my work, but I think it is also a lot of all of our work, is we can start to see, if we don't already articulate it, that our jobs and our work every day is not just preserving affordable housing. It is ensuring a basic human right uh, 
a right that is recognized by the UN Declaration of Human Rights, which has been ratified by the US many, many times. Um, and it's being part of the new civil rights movement in this country, which is very active today and very, very inspiring today. Um, and so like May Street Kid and so many others, we can say that we have committed to ensuring that everybody has the right, not to home ownership, but to safe and affordable housing. And to end, I wanna go back to Martha Biggs family and Jemaya and others. And after two years of living in their car, finally one day Martha said, I can't, I can't do this anymore. Somebody had called Child Protective Services on her. She was afraid she would lose her children. And so she said, there is no higher law than my responsibility as a mother to protect my children, to ensure that I have some place to put them to sleep at night. And so she worked with the Chicago Anti-Eviction Campaign and other social justice movements in Chicago, and they identified a Deutsche Bank-owned building that was trapped in a zombie foreclosure. It had been foreclosed on, the, tenant, the, the, the owner had left, and then the bank's own lawyers reported that it had broken a whole bunch of laws in the foreclosure process to the county, so then they'd halted it, and it had just been sitting in this zombie, no-nothing land for a few years. Nobody could buy it, nobody could develop it, nobody could live in it. And so she said, I'm gonna live here. I need to, ke I need to keep my, my family safe. And so she went in, it was unsecured, it was literally just open. <laughs> she went in, she fixed it up, she secured it, she met all the neighbors, and then she called all the media. She called the Chicago Tribune and all the local news stations and the New York Times and, and uh, CNN. And in front of a huge press conference, she got up and she said, listen, I'm an economic refugee from Cabrini Green, which is the public housing project that she and her family had lived in for a long time, which was torn down by the city of Chicago and never replaced. Those units were never replaced. And she said, I need a place to put my children to sleep at night and I am gonna live here. And she still lives there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura, for sharing your passion for affordable and fair housing and for inspiring us and getting us to think. And uh, we appreciate it very much.